Hello, this is Gavin Palmer with Hero Looking for Group. And today I will attempt to expose you to a thinker named Brent Cooper. Um, I enjoyed uh, this practice of asking questions and attempting to embody the spirit of learning and loving and respect. I think this is the this process is necessary to do this thing that Brent talks about, one of his ideas, which he thinks is important and I think is uh, important as well, is consensus building. Um, so that's his word. Um, the, um, at the, by the end of the video, he, he kind of really points out um, the heart, I think, of consensus building and sense making um, is to be pro-education. Um, he, he says he has a few things in this video that I think are uh, spot on, which I enjoy uh, and agree with. There are um, many things that he says that I could go ask more questions about if I had the time um, and we could attempt to um, engage in that consensus building process of him being able to, you know, pull me from you know straddling the fence to be more toward his side and for me to pull him toward the other side um, so that's what I'm interested in and this is what I'm trying to put on display if you are someone who is um, kind of uh, left-leaning uh, kind of anti-racist anti-fascist anti-capitalist I think you will enjoy a lot of what Brent says, and I would encourage you to connect with Brent and support him. Um, if you want to have a similar conversation like Brent and I have had, uh, please get in touch with me. And if you are, um, you know, if you don't like these labels, anti-racist, anti-fascist, anti-capitalist, you know, if you are kind of against all of these positions that Brent is um, advocating for, I would be willing to have conversations with you as well. Um, I would love to be able to do something similar to what I've done here so that I can, you know, attempt to embody this, uh, the, the right way of being, of being learning, loving, and listening such that um, we can explore ideas together um, such that we can, I think the goal should be to identify the most important problems and uh, the best answers for those problems. Um, I think Brent points out education as the most important problem, but we didn't even get into the process by which we could uh, begin to um, really improve upon our education systems. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Hello. Hey, nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, Brent. How are you? I'm uh, pretty good. I just uh, I just uh, came out of a job interview. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, do you, Do you mind if I record this? I just I do it for record keeping purposes more than uh, intention to post. But I want to make sure you're okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Thanks. That's fine with me. Cool. Um. Yeah. So. I, you know, we could probably talk about tons of things. Uh, I've only got 45 minutes. Okay. The main thing we, the main kind of point of reference over Twitter was Peterson and kind of different strategies about that. And so I'm, I'm totally open to whatever. I mean, I know that I come across like harsh and kind of like, like, like stubborn and disinterested, um, but I, I just, I take it very seriously. Like Jordan Peterson says some batshit crazy things and he means it, you know, it, it's not so much that he misspeaks and then people take it out of context and distort it. That happens, but it's more that if you really listen to him closely, he believes in some really crazy stuff and he believes it vehemently. Yeah. And, and I, and, and because I've worked on this problem for many years now, I have very limited faith in the ability of any of us to get through to each other, let alone Peterson. That's not stopping me from trying, you know, and I think, um, I think you already get a sense of that, right? Like you did a video 
kind of talking about me before and you do the, the hero looking for a group kind of thing. Um, but I still, you know, there's all these people like Verveke, John Verveke, Peter Lindbergh, David Fuller. I mean, those are people that know Peterson and are close to him. And I can't change their minds on things. And they're not going to change his mind on any things. So we have to definitely approach this as a meta problem in the first place. Not just, you know, like thinking we can get in there and earn Peterson's trust. Like he's extremely busy and extremely well funded at this point. You know, he he's not looking for a challenge. He's not a good faith public intellectual. But that's my that's my read on the situation. You know, if you're making efforts and making headway in, in those directions, I, I, I want to support that, too, and be a part of that. Yeah, don't I, I definitely have not made headway, uh, but I'm, I'm definitely I would I feel like you're a wealth of knowledge and I want to, you know, I've looked at your website and I'm, I'm glad to have a chance to talk to you. I'm, I'm just kind of my goal is just to try to understand um, your your views better at this point. And hopefully it would like I would love to be able to embody um, what like someone like Jordan Peterson would, would, would need to do, you know, in order to do error correction. So I'm kind of pretending, uh, in a, in a way, uh, um, but it's, I'm mostly focused on listening you know, I'm not, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, you know, do too much analysis or anything. So first I heard you say, um, uh, believes in really crazy stuff. And, um, and so like, what is it, what, what is like the most dangerous belief or beliefs and, and could you explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are, what are, sure. what are yeah. Well, we can start with relatively recent stuff, right? Okay. Because there's a whole backlog of stuff, but let me go just back a week. You know, this, um, trucker convoy along the Canadian border, you know, I I'm in Canada. Um, okay. this is an, an uh, it's a right wing anti-vax movement. That doesn't mean everybody that's taken in by it is right wing, but the the movement is what's called astroturfed. And that means like dark money and right wing ideas are funding the movement. And and a lot of the the leaders specifically, you know, whether they're self-appointed or kind of like um democratically supported as as leaders of this movement, many of them are like white nationalists. There's a lot of white anxiety, there's a lot of white rage right and in sociology and political theory you talk about race and you theorize race and racism it's not a big deal in the culture war it's a very big deal it's very confusing for people so peterson tweeted last week that there's no white supremacists in canada and he's and he stated as much like vehemently as i said like he's aggressive like no how dare anyone challenge me like this is fact like and so it's just false on the face of it. There are white supremacists in Canada. There are white nationalists. And sure, there's, you know, there's nuanced differences between the KKK and, you know, people who are worried about white replacement of, of populations, right? It's, it's a spectrum. But there are fascists. There are neo-fascists. There are white supremacists. In fact, I know personally a guy who's a white nationalist. Uh, he's, you know, he's, we're not friends, but I used to know him, uh, through, through a dance community and, you know, he became very unwelcome in that dance community. And, and I, I tracked him down. I didn't, I didn't know at the time, but he was always kind of a weird guy, but I tracked him down online from some of his online content. He's basically an activist for white nationalism. And this is very much in line with, you know, Stefan Molyneux, who Peterson has talked to. Peterson's been on his podcast. So Peterson has spoken to and worked with white supremacists of, of different varieties and degrees. And there he goes off on Twitter saying, oh, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no white supremacy. It doesn't exist. You know, and, you know, back in the fall, he had this viral comment saying anybody who talks about systemic racism, it, that it's low, low resolution thinking. I, I can tell you any of the hundreds of books I'm aware of on systemic racism are not low resolution. They're incredibly, you know, dense and faithful scholarship. So Peterson is just Ill illiterate in the worst ways. 
you know, he's, he's so angry and vengeful and it comes directly from the things he's ignorant about. And that's, that's the real tragedy here. It's like, he can say anything on any given day. It's easily debunkable, but he won't, you know, he won't accept it. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's more to this particular talking point. I, I could go, I could go on and on. Um, but you know, the race issue aside, he's, he's pro he's anti, he's anti mandates, right? So the trucker convoy was part of the anti mandate movement, which includes a lot of anti vax people, right? So just like the distinction between white supremacist and white nationalist, there's hardline anti vaxxers that are like can f full on conspiracy brain. And, and, you know, um, doing a lot of right wing stuff far far right and then there's anti-mandate people that are like oh i'm pro-vax i'm vaccinated even in some cases for some people i'm vaccinated of course but for some people they're like anti-mandate because they don't want it enforced from the government so peterson's big time on this train and supporting this trucker convoy and at the same time being in denial about what's actually under the surface what it actually is and so it's so I ironic but also directly harmful that Peterson supports far right movements that that um, that are not really legitimate political movements in the first place, right? Like Peterson has an affinity for indigenous culture, right? That's something he's open about. But is he supporting the First Nations protests across the country, protesting water rights issues, land rights issues? Uh, pipeline issues? Is he supporting them? And as they are subjected to police brutality? No, he's saying, fuck them, fuck these social justice warriors, you know, and that that's like ev everybody should see that for what it is. It's directly harmful. And I think it's, it's disgusting for anybody to be that naive. But somebody so revered as Peterson to be this deeply taken in by far right dogma and, and far right political movements at the same time, he's saying like, well, you know, he's admitting to be conservative, that he keeps going to the right, but he's also, dis he distances himself from far right movements occasionally, right? But there's a, there's a, there's a contradiction there because he'll say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm against the, 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 the neo-Nazis, the neo um, which especially in the United States, there's no question, right? Like we, we see them on TV and video clips. There's no question they exist. So Peterson will say, oh, I'm against that. But he still, you know, goes on Glenn Beck show, goes on St Stefan Molyneux show. People whose career trajectories are like openly invested in sort of white culture and, and defending the traditional white culture from the social justice left. And so, and so by, by this account, you know, he's not a credible public intellectual. Uh, and, and, you know, following, following my logic here, right. Then if Verveke or David Fuller gives him like softball questions, or they just talk about th theology and ph philosophy for hours on end, we don't change him. We don't change him. We don't help him be less angry. We don't help him learn things that he's blocking. It just enables him further. And, you know, with Verveke's audience, uh, a lot of people don't notice and don't see a problem with it. Um, but I notice, leftists notice, when, when we pay attention to these things. And, yeah. What, so, okay, so what is the... Um, so you, you said there's a... Like, there are these white nationalists and suprema, suprem, white supremacists, and they are um it's like and you use the word astroturf mm -hmm. uh or there's dark money um so what is what like what actually plays out so the way how do you see this with the, the truckers and uh white supremacists and white nationalists and dark money coming in like how is that how is that having what kind of an effect is that having that that um that we should be aware of and we should be uh trying to trying to work against Mm -hmm. I think there's a number of an uh, answers to that question. One is 
these campaigns, these AstroTurf campaigns, because they're so funded and it's a, it's a very much like, like, like marketing driven and, and PR driven and sort of meme driven to an extent that it's roping people in to a path, pathological ways of thinking. And just in general, just normal people, they're getting distracted from uh, political discourse and and th things that matter politically that are more relevant and more salient, like just the issue of healthcare, right? The general issue of healthcare. If people don't understand just at an abstract level, what single payer means or what universal healthcare means or what it means to have a socialized healthcare system, uh, they'll be more susceptible to be against it. And by being against it, they're more pro-market and pro-market solutions, pro-capitalist solutions to the healthcare crisis. And that invariably makes things worse, right? So there's a direct consequence by letting people's political literacy and political attention span be drawn away from things that matter and being able to be literate about the pandemic, getting sucked into conspiracy rabbit holes. So that's one answer, right? There's also, you know, that's more indirect. There's also always the direct harm, right? These, you know, the groups like Proud Boys are kind of an open, they've been, they've been, uh, they've been branded in Canada as terrorists. So the group is essentially illegal. But, um, but the Proud Boys are one of these men's rights groups that they, they organize themselves around things like fighting, ironically. And, uh, you know, they, they protest against, you know, social justice type stuff rather than be for anything. And so um, when Proud Boys go out there, either in the real world and, you know, fight or mistreat women, those are direct consequences, right, of this kind of just immature pathological community um but uh but also you know some of them like get like gavin mckinnis for example is the founder of the proud boys he has like youtube shows and stuff when he go and and so it's the same for alex jones or any of these sort of podcast hosts when they go on line and shout angry things about muslims or women or whatever there is stochastic effects that carry out into the real world, right? This, there's an idea of stochastic terrorism. So if uh, one of these pundits... I've never heard, I've never heard that before, stochastic it's a, it's, effects. It's a great term. Just Google it because there's a couple okay. articles on it. So you don't have to like take my translation of it. But it's like, you know, think of Ben Shapiro or something. These, these, these aggressive pundits, when they're advocating for violence even if they're being a bit like tongue in cheek or they're just being sensational. Tucker Carlson's a great example because Tucker Carlson speaks with a lot of what are called dog whistles, right? You use different coded language to uh, satisfy people's appetites for racism. Um, the, it's, it's, you know, using metaphors to cover up for the fact that you're doing something racist or advocating a policy that's racist. So when Tucker Carlson goes on Fox News and complains about white people issues, like complains, like defends kind of the, the identity crisis of white people and fear mongers about these issues and to various extents advocates violence. Some of his audience uh, takes that to heart and goes out and acts on it. In fact, in Canada, I think it was Quebec, but uh, but it could have been a different example. There was a there was a, a shooter, right? There's there's a you know school shootings, church shootings. These things these things happen across North America, mostly in the United States. But there was a specific example. Pretty sure it was a Canadian example where or, you know some place got shot up, a lot of people got killed, and then the investigation into this person revealed that one of his top like sources of media was Ben Shapiro. So directly, directly linked back to Ben Shapiro and to sort of the, the, the violent rhetoric and the misinformation that somebody like Ben Shapiro spouts. So, you know, when Peterson first came on the scene, I definitely kind of looked at him as a mix of good and bad. I thought, oh, he's written, you know, this book and, you know, he talks about all these issues that you, you can, you can read it as interesting. I can recognize why people are getting into him, 
But it became very obvious to me very quickly, too, with the intellectual dark web, that this informal friendship group and association of people is extremely dangerous. And it's not what it's re representing itself as, right? It represents itself as this open-minded kind of civil dialogue across the political spectrum, you know, and it, it, it sort of tries to live up to that to an extent. But the, the, you know, all the main people from Jordan Peterson to Ben Shapiro and Dave Rubin and the, the Weinstein brothers, they've all kind of further and fallen further into disrepute. And especially the more dangerous ones like Ben Shapiro, uh, they, they never had credibility on the left in the first place. But that's always what the IDW was, you know, a very self-congratulatory kind of mutual admiration society. It's another way to put it. Um, but really, they're glossing over each other's reactionary politics. And so with Peterson, it's like, I gave you one concrete example from like a week or two ago, but there's like a dozen or two dozen examples that I can draw from. You know, he's vehemently against veganism, feminism, Marxism, postmodernism. You know, he just, he takes a caricature of these things and then he talks as if he's done the research, which it's pretty clear that he hasn't. And then through that impassioned rhetoric, he manages to convince a lot of people that he's right. Uh, uh, climate change is another issue. You know, he's, he's, a, he's what's called a, a lukewarmer. You know, he's, he's like scientifically literate about climate change, but he's kind of denying that it's a serious problem. And, you know, he might as well be a full-blown denialist. Uh, and then the whole, you know, capitalism versus socialism thing. Peterson is extremely explicit that he's pro-capitalist and believes capitalism can solve all of our problems. And this is not only wrong on the face of it, it's, it's, it's appealing to a lot of reactionaries, but it's, um, you know, not, not to say there's not nuance there to unpack with that debate, but, but Peterson kind of says, well, the debate's closed. Capitalism's not the problem, right? So he's got this real, like, idealized caricature of capitalism itself, which just doesn't hold up. And, and so, you know, it comes back to, like, like there's sort of a consensus in social science and in, in sociology that capitalism is problematic. You know, it's a, it's a core, it's a cornerstone of critical theory to talk about capitalism. And Peterson acts like none of that discourse exists. He just disparages it. So, so I, you know, I, I get, I get angry. I get like Peterson's angry, but I get angry in opposition because he's incredibly influential. A lot of people don't see it, like don't see the problems for one reason or another. Um, and, and it, it, it's directly holding back a kind of paradigm shift that we need to have that we need to have the uh one of the words i know that you've used is um what is it oh i, I had some notes it's um a consensus mm -hmm. so it it seems like yeah it seems like you so so you have you have beliefs based on the material you've read, um, and credit and and um, and Jordan, basically he he does not share the same beliefs with you and and you, and then I'll, I guess I need to ask what what is, what's with this word uh, consensus and like is it in, so do you see it as being like necessary for us to kind of converge on some set of beliefs that are. Um, in order for our, the best future possible? Is that how you see um, kind of the state we're in? Yeah, I appreciate the question because I have written on consensus and I mean it in two ways when we talk about it casually here. There is already implicit consensus about a bunch of things, but there's also a process of explicit consensus building. Um, and, and to be sure, there's also, you know, the word consensus is used, for example, like, the neoliberal consensus, right? I don't think that 
consensus holds anymore. But at the time, in the, the 70s, the 80s, there was a sort of neoliberal consensus, right? And that meant that what, what in that case, whether it's it's built or it's de facto, you know, it just emerged. I think it's more the latter. It just emerged. But but there was a there was design elements. There was actually a specific person that I think wrote up a kind of neoliberal consensus manifesto, and then a lot of people just agreed with it. And that's that's a wrong. That's there's a lot wrong. There's a lot wrong with that. On you know by the same token, when I talk about the implicit consensus of social scientists, I remember a statistic going back many years that um, international relations theorists were polled about the Iraq war, 95 or 92 to 95 percent of them were against the Iraq war. Right. So right there, you have a pretty strong consensus over 90 percent of people. Right. Vaccination rates. Right. Here in British Columbia, we have 80 percent vaccination rates. That's an implicit de facto consensus that the public that has emerged from the public as a result of various uh, people, you know, people talking amongst themselves, public education strategies. Right. The, the vax rates vary depending on what places and regions we're talking about. And, and so there's lots of implicit consensus. And, and I do tend to, you know, through reading and through listening to different sources, kind of take, try to take in the implicit consensus about different things, right? When, with respect to Jordan Peterson, over the years, hundreds, hundreds of leftist articles, critiques came out. They all said slightly different things, but there was a through line. You know, they always kind of pointed out that he was wrong about Marxism, wrong about postmodernism, all these sorts of things. So there's sort of an implicit consensus, even if everybody was taking their own line of attack. And then I've written about the process of consensus building, which I think is fascinating. You know, if we get a cohort together and we say, well, we're going to go through this process. It's not, it's not quite a class. It's not quite a workshop. You know, there's, there's specific goals. There's different types of consensus building. It, it, it means different things in practice if you're in a, in a business and you're a manager and you want to build consensus with your employees versus debating, you know, different philosophical or political issues or policy issues. But within the kind of communities where, where we cross paths, there's not a lot of active consensus building. There's a lot of plurality, a lot of diversity of views and a lot of tolerance of the diversity of views. And, and there's specific things for me that are just obviously true or obviously good, right? So my politics is, is not so partisan as it would seem because I advocate things like universal health care, a Green New Deal, right? And, and, and things like this, which, which have mass support already, right? You know, cannabis legalization is, is another point of consensus. And in fact, um, you know, that's something intellectual dark web types agree on, too. There hasn't always been a consensus. It's always been a politicized issue, right? Drugs have been prohibited. So prohibition, the practice of kind of suppressing even drug research, has, you know, continues to this day. But there's a consensus that's emerging that that's, that's wrong and that's har harmful. And we could actually do a lot better for people, for mental health, for economic growth, if we legalize drugs. So, you know, coming back to what I want to build consensus about, you know, the definition of metamodernism is extremely important to me, right? Because if we don't have a rigorous shared definition, nobody knows what they're talking about. They just think they do. And in terms of policy sets, right, whatever political persuasions people have, whatever their character, whatever their, um, you know, temperament is, we should be able to educate each other, like have, have, have a cohort, like I said, and convince everybody through consensus building. And consensus building is like the opposite of groupthink. Right. It's it's a consensus can emerge from a particular process that is robust and true and all these things. So with something like healthcare, because it's so politicized, I'd want everybody to agree. So when the political opportunity comes up to vote on healthcare and change the paradigm there, 
that it happens, that it gets executed, that there's less confusion, there's more of a landslide towards making that change. And that's, that's you know, having universal health care is just better for everybody. We're talking about baselines that, um, uh, you know, a country like the United States struggles with, you know, eliminating illiteracy, eliminating poverty, um, dismantling the military industrial complex and repurposing it how to depolarize politics like i like we can build consensus about the process itself about the ideals about the the end state policies about divisive figures like jordan peterson you know i th uh, but but um, this practice is rarely formally carried out because it takes a lot of investment takes a lot of everybody's time and and sort of commitment right so you need you need a cohort you need time you need resources and and just one final point about that you know i've, I've also spoken about consensus at the stoa not that that was a great talk but i always bring up the key point consensus building works well in conditions of low trust and high uncertainty and i think we we are in a state where people are very uncertain about you know meaning and politics and what to do and trust is very, very low right people trust trump and he betrays that trust and there's a lack of trust in institutions in mainstream media in health authorities right there's a deep lack of trust and there's legitimate reasons for that sometimes but the consensus building process helps restore trust it helps reduce uncertainty so i'm i'm very passionate about trying to get people interested in that yeah the um i think that's the reason i was drawn to you was this idea um i so i guess the yeah the uh, and part of this conversation um or my questioning uh for, of your position your position and your thinking on jordan peterson is the background of this is um you know how yeah what would it take in order to um, encourage and facilitate people with different beliefs, you know, coming to the table um, and somehow arriving at consensus. So there's a part of me that thinks that that would be very difficult. There's probably some some barriers that that we have to learn about, um, but it, it definitely seems like a worthwhile endeavor. Um, what this yeah. is a this is so. Have, do you have success with consensus building like in your life where you've had like I have a hard time in my life uh, managing to convert people into a different view or belief is like do you actually have you experienced this like for yourself converting your beliefs and or other people converting their beliefs? I've definitely changed my mind on things. I've definitely seen people move the needle themselves on different issues. I've I've been able to move people a little bit nothing too dramatic but in terms of a cohort i've not practiced this I, I i did a stoa session which was sort of a practice run uh i did another session independently um before that which about 11 12 people showed up and that felt really good actually just to have like 12 people show up because it just became a kind of i mean you can't do it in one session um but if you already all agree on certain things you're off to a good start but, um, and then I did one other presentation about, uh, about consensus building in another group. So I've done it three times, technically. I'm, it's just one of many articles and, and methods that I have and want to apply. But I'm also, I'm just starting to sort of reboot the community building aspect of things. Like, like, uh, my think tank has been very much a solo project. You know, I just... I just call it a think tank. It structures the way I think and do research, but I'm inviting other people to join the Patreon and I'm switching from writing to producing video content. Right. And that's why I'm recording everything. And I, I don't just record the zoom call. Like I'm using my green screen right now and like recording into OBS. Right. So it's all about, I'm actually trying to like hijack the narrative um, in a sense. And I can't do that if I only have a few hundred subscribers and like, I've got 21 patrons 
right now, which is negligible. You know, I've only had like a dozen for like three years straight. So, you know, I, I'm everybody I talk to, I'm like, Hey, join for a dollar, you know, like, what do you, what do you have to lose? You know, come, come inside the discord, um, uh, uh, you know, do an interview like this. Right. And, and let me record so I can like take sound bites or whatever. Um, because, yeah, and in the, in the past, you know, to kind of self critique here, I've not, I've, I've tried to take on too much and I've, I've hoped that things would take off and I kind of made headway in different directions and got some gigs and stuff, but I haven't experienced anything like the growth, like the Stoa or Rebel Wisdom has had. And I feel like I know those guys, right? So it's a little unfair. It's very asymmetrical. And so I, I, I have to, you know, be healthy and positive, you know, come from a good place and I have to produce content. And, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with outreach and, you know, um, solicitation and evangelism. I'm not comfortable with any of those things, and, but I have to do it. Right. And so the more people who join, the easier it gets, right? Like if we, you know, I'm at 21 patrons right now. I'm struggling to even add like a patron or two per week. It would be great if I could get a patron every day, hit 50, hit a hundred, hit 200, hit 500, hit a thousand. Um, because all of it will go into the project. I think, I think people should know that about me and trust that about me at this point that like, I've self-funded everything up until this point. I've been on, I, I got a disability income for the past three years and that just kind of takes care of me. But, but the project has been starved. You know, the project has next to no funding. Um, and if I had the resources and the attention that the Stoa had or Rebel Wisdom had, it would be easier. It would be easier and better for everybody. I'd be able to influence those spaces more rather than just sort of get get my occasional appearance or or critique them from the outside. And and game game B, of course, I've been highly critical of game B. And that's that's me like taking the hit too, making sacrifices in order to try to speak truth to power. So so but yeah, I'm I'm pivoting to being more of a more of a public facing actor if you will the uh so you have so yeah, you you've mentioned a few people that, and yeah i guess you're connected to some of these people and um and you have you have these you know you have this goal you, you just said speak truth to power um this goal of consensus building um, and you have these, you have these beliefs that you, you know, I, I'm, I'm imagining you don't think you're perfect. So in this consensus building process, there would be some convergence of, of beliefs as you do this with people. So it is something that I sense of, as being missing in our sense making space. Um, so that definitely, you know, figuring out how to do that and, and practicing, practicing it, that's something I'm interested in. And, and I, like my hope is that like this kind of conversation, um, it's just a practice where we, we mm -hmm. learn to do it better. So yeah. in this, in this conversation is, it's, it was more me trying to understand your beliefs. Um, and, and we would, we could spend a lot of time going into each one, uh, a whole bunch of time going into each one. Um, but I imagine, I think my point that I wanted to get to is like, you could, you could do, there's a, I think of it kind of like of a game, you know, there's a process, a protocol, and you can get with people who have different beliefs and you engage, you put in the time and the effort with the goal that uh, people move towards some type of consensus. So um, it would be nice to see that. I don't know if these people that you have, that you can't, that you do have connections with, how many people would be willing to engage like that. Um, I personally mm -hmm. would be willing to put in some time like that not condensed amount of time, like hours in a week, but, you know, regularly spread out over time, um, you know, talking about uh, our beliefs, um, trying to understand our beliefs and why, you know, that belief, you, I look at it like a belief has trade-offs. So 
um, I like to understand what's the risk of that belief and what's the benefit of that belief. Um, and it, it's something that I definitely see missing. And I, I would like for us to figure out how to do that. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. And also a, a parallel idea of consensus is like synthesis, you know, and I think, I think since synthesis can be built collectively, but it can also be, uh, worked on individually and privately and and to a large extent it, it can be a, an individual exercise right and that's what i do is i try to take in a lot of different sources not necessarily like all the diversity of opinion but like um, a, a narrower you know kind of span of perspectives as opposed to beliefs or opinions and then you kind of get get a kind of um you know, uh, view from space or, you know, you kind of just can, can, um, abstract and frame things differently. Right. So, so there are people who do great synthesis, right. And, you know, transdisciplinary work and, you know, blending politics and geopolitical analysis and culture and social theory. And, and I think there's a lack of synthesis too, in these spaces, there's a lot of mapping and pluralism sort of throwing things together and just, you know, case in point, I talked to Joe Lightfoot yesterday about his liminal web piece and, uh, and, and, and we, we have a very constructive interaction. And then I, and before that I talked to Chris D if you know who that is. And I, I pretty sure that I came across both Chris D and you first in, um, in the noetic nomads discord. That that kind of space is where I think I think some of us cross paths first, right? And so and so, I'm reaching out to people more than they're reaching out to me. But uh, but 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 that's you know, I've I for the past year and a half I've kind of like not been so productive, right? I've still been doing things and consuming things, but now I'm back in production mode. It's about. Uh, it's about like utilizing those networks, you know, the net and the networks that have been built, like whether it's the Stoa or Rebel Wisdom or whatever. And, you know, the, those, <laughs> there's definitely other things that I'm very interested in, you know, um, but I want to, and it's going to come down to me and what I can produce, but um, I've only got a few minutes left. Um, coming back to the Patreon thing, like in the past couple weeks, I've put out four patron only videos. And that's the first time I've done that because I've had this Patreon for, for three years, but I've never made anything behind the paywall. Right. And I've, I've never aggressively recruited. And so now, and it is like still very costly for me up front, but I've started producing patron only content which gives me a bit of a buffer to test things out with people and to, and to keep it hidden. And I do have the intention to start making it public, but I want to invite, you know, I want to like prove my track record through this content, start making things public. But um, the more people that come inside sooner, the easier it gets. Right. So like I said, I'm at the, I'm at the, the fourth video I posted two days ago and I spent a few hours today recording about Ukraine, about that situation. Obviously lots of people are covering that, but I, 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 I watched a ton of videos and I'm just, I'm just trying to give my kind of, you know, first impression meta analysis because sometimes the, the details don't matter that much. Like, Oh, like what did NATO do and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, that stuff matters, but, not in terms of people's armchair political analysis. What matters is that, I mean, again, this comes back to implicit consensus. Look around the world right now. Pretty much everybody is against Putin and what's happening, right? So you're seeing the mobilization of like mainstream media, like uh, st various state actors, you know, and, and sanctioning Russia from all sides, right? Russia is not going to last through what they're doing. You know, we're, we're just coming up on a week of invasion and bombardments. But anyways, that's just to say I've, I've started to cover it today. I'd like to put something out there and actually make it public as soon as possible. Um, 
because it's part of it's part of the accelerated growth of this project and it's part of making a difference on every single issue and you know i never wanted to be a political pundit but that's becoming a necessary part of of what i have to do you know to achieve my goals as a writer i can't really depend on other people i kind of i've been let down with a lot of those attempts so uh yeah that's that's my pitch to say like join for a dollar and you'll get access to everything uh, and then there's you know there's higher tiers you can contribute to but there's no there's no additional rewards at this point i just want numbers of people it, and that's why i set the bar low at a dollar and so you know, I'm, 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 I'm passionate about pitching like this, but I'll burn myself out really quickly if I'm just doing sales calls every day. Right. So I also want to like, you know, convince one person and then they go con convince one person and then they go convince one person. Right. So people really see this as a, as a collective and, and as a group activity, because it's never been about this guy. Really. It's always about you know, what is abstraction? How do people abstract? What is the big picture? What are think tanks? How, how do we do collective intelligence when different groups are really per perverting that concept and developing large right-wing followings? Um, I think I'm in a good position to, to, to lead, so to speak, but at the same time, I, I can't do it without people like yourself, like Joe Lightfoot, like Chris D., um, you know, and some of the other people I've convinced to become patrons like Daniel Gortz, Hanzi. Um, and I'd like, I'd like to get more women, more minorities, of course, get, get, get more diversity. But I mean, those are the things I'm advocating for already. And, right. and so it's, a uh, it's just, it, everything will get easier the more people are involved. And because I've seen other communities, succeed or fail based on how they conduct themselves and how they like lead with different ideas. I think we can be in a good position to, to, you know, build, build a common core. There's kind of two major kind of themes. One is left politics, right? What is that? What can we agree on is the best um, kind of coalition or foundation and the other is metamodernism, right? What is it? Is it left wing? Is it transpartisan? I think it's a bit of both. Um, and then uh, I have other research streams, abstraction being a core one. But in terms of how people, what are, what are people going to connect with? They're not going to connect with abstraction so so much and so fast, like 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 I have. It's a it's a very complex idea. But left politics and metamodernism, I think, I think those are the things that are very difficult to sew together. But I'm in a good position to, to um, start that and to, you know, just teach it and to build consensus. And then, and then everything else kind of falls into place, like Peterson, intellectual dark, dark web stuff. Um, it's about kind of looking at things from the highest level of abstraction. So you have maximum detail and then distilling what, what the core truths are, what the core principles are. Okay. Well, I know you, I know you have to go and yeah, I'll check out, I'll, uh, I'll at least sign up for, you know, one payment and check it out. And the, uh, yeah. And, and good luck because, you know, like I'm an, I'm an engineer okay, and cool. I, I, I love to, um, I'm very interested in trying to help with the sense making at scale. Like, I don't think humans have figured out how to do it. And I do put a lot of, like, I don't know the answers. I tend to be agnostic on a lot of things, but I, I do put my faith in, you know, humans being able to figure this out, um, using technology and working mm -hmm. together. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds but, good. I'll just say to that point, you know, these things get mystified. And so we're all trying to come up with creative solutions. Uh, like, 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 like mind hacks that we can scale and distribute like the Stoa and game B are kind of famous for that. Um, and I think they get a lot of things wrong. The simple answer, the place all of us should be starting is just be pro education. 
right? And this is like very much falls along the culture war lines. Like right now, the right wing is trying to gut education. They have been for a long time, but they're going after everything. They're saying, oh, you can't teach racism anymore and blah, blah, blah. You have to, at a structural level, support a massive expansion of education infrastructure, right? That means forgiving student debt. This is something Bernie Sanders was very pro and Biden has kind of been on the fence about forgiving student debt, making education free in the first place, making it more accessible and kind of um, kind of as a lifestyle and a career path itself. Right. Because there's I think there's just compounding benefits. You know, it, it gets people out of dangerous situations. It, it applies them to uh, whether it's solving real world problems like you do as an engineer or solving, you know, philosophical quandaries, you know, we need all of it. And so just to demystify it, you know, everybody should be like super pro education, right? What do we see from all the anti-woke people? They want to shut down universities. They think universities are the, are the center of, of the insurrection against Western civilization, right? That's, that's crazy. You want to scale up people's critical thinking? education it's not right. going to be jordan hall's kind of like bag of tricks of like you know kind of ooda loops or sovereignty or or situational assessments that shit drives me nuts because jordan hall is not an educator you know he's a tech bro business guy that's just who he is you know that's just he's not an educator so yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk, Gavin, and yeah. um, for hearing me and asking great questions. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. We'll connect again soon. All right. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Bye.